You're listening to the MindPod Network. Thank you to all of you that supported the podcast with your very generous donation. And of course, you can always support the podcast by using the Amazon portal to buy your stuff or head on over to iTunes and leave this podcast a review or a rating. Thank you so much. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all Welcome to the podcast. It's all happening with Zach Leary. That is me, your host. Episode 113 of the It's All Happening podcast. That's a lot of episodes, isn't it? Wow, pretty cool. It's definitely getting to the point to where I can't remember what episodes happened at what time and how long ago that was and what I said on this episode and what I said on that episode. But then again, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit because I can't really remember what I even said last week, uh, this week on the podcast, though I do know who's on the podcast, so I'm going to say that. We have Corey Allen on the podcast, who is the host of a very, very cool podcast of his own called The Astral Hustle, and Corey is based out of Austin, Texas, and working on a great new book, which we'll talk about in a second. There is one thing that happened recently that I do want to, I guess, plug or mention. Um, Are You Serious, who was one of the editors and founders and guiding visionaries behind the magazine Mondo 2000, which is really the predominant cyber culture magazine of the early 90s, which was breaking ground, talking about virtual reality and the promise of the web and all of these things as they were sort of bubbling up before they... uh, took hold in the mainstream. Uh, The magazine has folded a long time ago, but RU has sort of put together a Mondo 2000 archive online, as well as uh, some new articles now and then that make their way into a, a new digital press. So Are You Serious interviewed me on the topic of Timothy Leary's final years and really encouraging me to dig deep into the emotional well of my memory bank to share my recollections and uh, opinions, uh, my perspective 21 years later on what those years were like and what the lifestyle was like, what he was like, what was going through his head, at least, you know, from where I sat. So, you know, I've talked about this before in other venues, but there was something about these questions and the style of RU's wording that really had the ability to elicit some uh, emotional, deep, deep wells that I hadn't really uh, revisited in quite a long time. So, yeah, I do want to share that with the world. So go to mondo2000.com and check it out for yourself. It was a good time to go down the rabbit hole to the valleys of yesterday. Before we get into the podcast with Corey Allen, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the meteoric rise and influence of Jordan Peterson. I'm sure many of you who listen to the podcast are aware, even involved and entertained with the meteoric rise of Canadian philosopher and psychologist Jordan Peterson. His YouTube channel is, uh, you know, the number of views is just going through the roof. Some of them having over a million views with his uh explorations of biblical ideas and chaos theory and chaos and order and the hierarchy of authority and his um, unraveling of mysticism and 
his uh, very uncanny ability to take ancient mysticism and unfold it into modern day life. Um, however, if he just stopped at that and that was the bulk of his content, I, for one, certainly would have no issue with him. He is uh, extremely intelligent, very well educated, and presents his ideas uh, in a manner that is worthy of being a first-rate intellectual. However, his appeal is really coming on, I don't want to say the heels, but it is really appealing to young adults, especially males. It's kind of become an indication of their hunger for truth and responsibility as he really advocates for personal responsibility and to sort yourself out, as he says. So he's kind of giving them um, this very almost like father-like, hard-ass, tough love, cold approach to unraveling your shit and just getting on with your life. However, in the middle of all that, there is a whole other side of his passion topics that are uh, bubbling up that take on um, the debunking of white privilege, the debunking of Black Lives Matter and some very controversial views around the transgender movement and his recent proclamations and uh, declarations about the gender pay gap, gap and how that actually doesn't exist. So, you know, my problem with that is because of his very harsh, direct um, kind of to the jugular style, I think it is actually a promotion of casual bigotry and systemic racism that people really don't know that they are validating while they are doing it. Because all of these minority groups of all of these, um, you know, subcultures that are fighting for equal rights, you know, they have a hard enough time as it is. Why do we need an intellectual of such superior ability to take down Black Lives Matter and the transgender movement and to spend time debunk debunking white privilege? What good does that do our society to make it even more challenging for the underprivileged to find an equal voice? To me, that is not um, a character of disruption. He is not being an agent of disruption. He is being more of the same. So my good friend Sita Ramdas wrote a very, very uh, fantastic blog piece on his website that articulated uh, many of my opinions much better than I could. So I'm going to read just a little bit of it. In the video, Jordan Peterson debunks white privilege. He states, I can't quite figure out why the postmodernists have made the canonical distinctions they've made. Race, ethnicity, sexual proclivity, and gender identity. Those are four dimensions along which people vary. But there is a very large number of dimensions along which people vary. There are an infinite number of dimensions. So the postmodern question is, why would you privilege some of those distinctions over others? Here he's not making any real arguments of merit. He's simply using pseudo-intellectual lines of logic to obfuscate what should be plainly clear. These distinctions are four of the primary ways that we discriminate and oppress in our culture. This is not a philosophical abstraction. For people of color, women, and members of the LGBTQIA community, this is a daily reality. So what he calls identity politics is a needed remedy to a system that unfairly privileges whiteness, maleness, middle and upper classness, etc., etc. So I'll post the link for that blog in the post on the website for this episode. Uh, I certainly don't want to vilify Jordan Peterson. I don't think he is the enemy, but I do encourage everyone to kind of take a 360 view of the message that he is disseminating out into the public and decide for yourself if it's healthy and productive or not. So this week on the podcast, Corey 
Allen. He's writing a book called Now is the Way, which will be out this time next year. And we talked a lot about uh, his process for the book and a lot of the topics that he is exploring while writing it. Uh, Corey is a wonderful mind. He is what I like to call a practical spiritualist. Uh, there's a saying within the 12 step community if it's not practical, it's not spiritual. And I think Corey is a real embodiment of that. He distills meditation and the importance of meditation and the practice of meditation and how it can affect your life in a positive way and thus change your outlook and your perception of the world at large. He does it in a way that really makes sense, I think, for almost anyone. And I really enjoyed being uh, having him as a guest on, on the show. Um, and I hope we could do more of these exchanges. He was a wonderful conversationalist. And check out his podcast, too, The Astral Hustle, also part of the MindPod Network. So here we go. <laughs> Well, um, let's just let's just get into it. You're working on your book, AC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. life is good, man. Just um, working on that all day, every day, pretty much. <laughs> it's crazy, man, how the pitch is like I don't know, fifty percent or sixty percent of the whole the whole sale. You know, so weird. <laughs> so it is, but you know, the, I at first I was just artistically a little like, ugh, all right, I hate this part of it. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know what, this is really, you know, however you want to dress it up. Like if you take a step back and look at it, this is really a business proposal Yeah, because right. there's this big company that is going to give you a lot of money and they want to make sure that they have a successful business relationship with you. And I, I get that. I totally get it. And I think once I started looking at it like that, I was like, all right, well, let's, let's do this right. You know, and I, I really went, uh, what I feel was the maximum amount of everything I could have put into my proposal, I put into it. Yeah, and yeah, and also these days with the climate of publishing, you know, because putting yourself out there to support a book's success is a very different, um, you know, it's a very different animal than it, than it than it was in the past because there are so many different media opportunities between, you know, podcasting like what we do. I mean, we have authors on on our podcasts, you know, and mm -hmm. and television and print and, you know, kind of the savviness. And I think sort of like it's much more important than it's ever been. It's very, very hard to be like, a, especially in the nonfiction uh, you know, genre uh, segment like like we are. I mean, you can't be a Thomas Pynchon and just disappear in, in Canada <laughs> and you know and mail in. You know, <laughs> you can <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird how you have to like. Um, I don't know. You have to get out there and like tap dance for everybody and make your profile and like your your persona known in this strange way um, and. It's kind of weird, man, is that like followers, you know, in quotes on social media or podcast download numbers and stuff like that, that they have such an impact on what a publisher is willing to to, you know, or the scale in which they're willing to work with you whenever so much of that stuff does not translate directly to engagement. You know, you look at, right. at web pages or, or, you know, Facebook pages or whatever that have million, 2 million followers. And then they have maybe 50 likes on a post or three likes on a post. It's like wow. those numbers are so skewed and it's all about engagement, you know? Well, but that, that's a very telltale sign for people who buy likes as well. Right. You know, right. right. <laughs> that's one of the saddest things to me, man, is whenever you look at somebody's like Instagram and they have 80,000 followers, but then like one like or two likes per post and all the comments are like, great page. Thanks for the content. Like stuff like that where it's like, ah, oh, dang, it hurts, man. It hurts seeing that. Just be yourself, dude. Uh, well, so tell, tell me, tell us, tell me, tell us about your book. Yeah, sure thing. So basically, it's called uh, Now is the Way, and it is not a collection of New Age platitudes. It is 
a look at the fact that, you know, based on the way that the human has evolved and intersected with technology and uh, the amount of static that it is in our lives, you know, nowadays with with Internet and with our hyper connectivity, uh, that in combination with the fact that we're dealing with our I think we're dealing with evolutionary hangovers right now. You know, we're fresh out of the jungle. We're figuring out as sapiens how to uh, deal with modern life still and, and civilization, all these things. Basically, you know, we never get a chance to actually live our lives because we have so much noise and clutter in our heads that's keeping us separated from our own experience in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And so this book is basically uh, based on my own uh experiences how to get that static out of your mind so that you can actually live your life but that static that is in your mind and i i agree and i am also a i i, I don't want to say a victim of that static but <laughs> uh, because i i don't, don't believe in victimhood but sure that static is in my consciousness a lot of the time i've been using some kind of a device or computer every day since 1983 you know I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's morphed into my into my dna that makes up myself but so but do you also acknowledge at the same time like helping people to get rid of that static and actually live their lives there is no going back though i mean that static or you know the inclusion of or participation with this sort of, you know, tech, technological, I guess, dimension that has that has accompanied the human experience. I mean, there's no way to really shut it down at this point. Oh, absolutely! It's all about like realizing it's there and then figuring out how to like manage it as best as you can and work with it. And in the process, uh, get a, gain a perspective on yourself. You know, I, I I'm kind of sneaky in the book in that. Um, through my own suffering <laughs> over the last, you know, 20 years or so, uh, figuring out the, the ways that I think are necessary or, or what I see is the most, um, uh, beneficial and helpful ways to gain that perspective of the self. And that is by, you know, gaining, uh, self-awareness outside of yourself, beginning to gain awareness of your ego, Uh, Being able to then tap into your compassion after you've woken up to a greater sense of awareness because it's necessary to deal with a higher level of perception Um, and then some tools around mindfulness and meditation Uh, and then, um, you know, ways on how to actually be comfortable with yourself. You know, it's, and it's one of these things that, uh, things that people don't often talk about. It's like people are not comfortable with who they are, man. Yeah. You know, I, I look at people and people are just there's this low level resting anxiety of people these days or maybe it's been always they're just not comfortable in their own skin, you know, and part of that is because of our society and culture, of course. And then also we're like these these little squirrels that are dropped into <laughs> and we're given briefcases and suits and all of a sudden we're like in the middle of this big, uh, you know, this society and it's complex civilization, which um commands so much stability and uh it's hard man it's hard and so i go into that and then i you know also go into that everyone else is all good too it's because (laughs) one of the you know those are two of the chapter titles right now is you're golden and then the next one is everyone else is golden too because like that's a big part of people's inability to just relax and let go and be comfortable themselves is through a defense mechanism. They try and identify the shortcomings in in ways to become cagey with others to create a sense of hierarchical, uh, you know, placement of themselves or even other people to feel comfortable. So it's like, look, you're all good. Everyone else is all good. Everybody relax. (laughs) Well, I feel like, you know, with uh, it's and God, so so many things with, with you just said there, but you know this disconnect between people being comfortable with themselves yet portraying this image especially in social media that everything is all good and then you sort of create this little micro ecosystem of you know your projection of like how Zach Larry is going to be 
portrayed to the world with mm-hmm. my 11,000 Facebook followers and, you know, and my Instagram, you know, and then it's kind of like you create this kind of this crafted selective narrative for how you're presenting yourself to the world. Um, and most people do it in a way that excludes the mess. Mm -hmm. like social media is just about like how smart you are how pretty you are um you know and and this sounds kind of like a dig but like how hot you are if you're sure like a self-styled instagram model you know and there's no mess there's nothing wrong in social media everything's fantastic you know Mm -hmm. and that i mean did you in, in in writing your book are you kind of uncovering some of like the disconnect there like what i mean i just feel like it's a profound problem oh absolutely man yeah i mean it's and it's not just on social media but just in life you know because people do that personally if you are having people don't in don't not feeling comfortable with themselves you know people try and shroud like what they're feeling and can't even you get to a point where because we are a tribal culture that wants to be included, we, we don't want to be alienated from the collective because, uh, you know, ultimately it is uh, necessary for our survival. And so on a genetic level, we have uh, signals coming from our DNA telling us, like, be a part of the group because then you can survive and then you can procreate. And that's ultimately our function as far as organisms. <laughs> um, but so we, we, tr- we shroud our vulnerabilities because we think that it might make us, uh, you know, susceptible to, to attacks or to exclusion or something like that. And so what ends up happening is that like people get around their best friends and whenever they have a problem, um, they might talk about surface level stuff that doesn't really have any effect on, on their, um, their life. But to actually share aspects of ourselves with each other and to know how to be comfortable with what we're feeling like in real life situations and how to to listen to what we're feeling and to actually share it and, and, you know, um, begin to work with it is like this thing that people just don't really do too much. Hmm. And I think that if you can begin to be comfortable with what you're feeling, uh, be able to acknowledge the fact that you are suffering or you are uncomfortable or something um, that allows you to let go of that veneer way of living of just like, hey, I, I have to act like everything is all good all the time. And I have to portray this curated narrative online of how everything is always uh, rosy and I, the light is always hitting you know the bone structure of my face just perfectly. You know, it's like it, you just get out of all that and it's like get out of playing the human game to where um, you can really just be yourself and not worry about that. And, and I do address something that I, I think is, is critical in this bizarre irony. One of the many of the human experiences that like everyone goes around trying to portray their idea or put forward their idea of what is going to be affable and looked at as cool and sexy and and successful and all this stuff. But that idea is a subjective understanding of what all those things mean. And so what we're doing is we have our subjective understanding of what all those things mean. And we're trying to portray them in a way that will speak to the subjective understanding of the subjective understanding of everyone who's looking at that stuff. So really we're all just like a million miles away from actually being authentic. And the irony is that the people who everyone actually finds interesting and actually finds, uh, you know, worth paying attention to is people who are themselves and they don't play that, you know, the game of trying to portray all these symbols and they just are comfortable with who they are. Do you, yes. I mean, there, there's, you're right. And I think the people even, you know, if I, if I don't agree with them, I mean, you could even, possibly make the case for that with Donald Trump. I mean, I haven't really thought about it, but he is authentic. Like, you know, I think he's a terrible person, but I think (laughs) he is kind of authentic in his terrible, terribleness. And it does rise to the top. But do you think let's from an evolutionary standpoint or a historical standpoint, maybe kind of looking at, the last two or 300 years. I mean, I really like to look at, and my book deals with uh, um, this subject a lot of sort of looking at our relationship with the world around us and technology and ourselves um, in the context of just pre-industrial revolution. 
Mm -hmm. just as things were really starting to change from kind of a a dark medieval feudal age and post-agrarian age into sort of what we now refer to as the modern world. But I, but I suspect that say two or 300 years ago, like I just watched John Adams, the HBO Mm -hmm. miniseries about John Adams and revolutionary America, which I love. I love that time period. For some reason, I feel people didn't have these problems then. I think this is a schism of the modern age. Mm -hmm. I think that people like, you know, the average person two or I mean, two or 300 years ago, they were sort of very comfortable in their role and being present in that reality. And, you know, I'm a farmer. That's what I do. And I'm proud of it. And I take care of my family and, you know, I'm present and polite for the, to the person that kind of crosses my path and delivers the news that the British are trampling on Concord or something. You mm-hmm. know? <laughs> right. I just feel like it was a simpler time. And then the, and the, the static, as you refer to it, of, of the modern age has really created this, this uh, kind of discourse or the, the, this just friction and this, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm, I'm lo- looking for? Um, yeah, just this kind of th- this schism and this dissonance, I mean, with, um, with our relationship with ourselves that hasn't always been there. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah, I mean, you look at like, as far as the you know, Industrial Revolution era, there's... From the time the first paved road was paved 200 years ago in Bristol to the time you know where the first iPhone was invented was two and a half lifetimes, yeah. you know, two and a half generations. <laughs> We're from the first paved road to the iPhone. And so think about like, you know, the speed of the evolution of, of the human mind is hundreds of thousands of years, mm-hmm. but we're working up against, you know, the speed of technology, which is compounding that rapidly. And I, so I think that, you know, in, in, as you were talking about in the era of, of or right around the industrial revolution, there are people that like life was simple because we had self-awareness and there was like enough to keep us from walking into, you know, um, or off the side of a cliff or something like that. And that's very helpful. Um, and, but, but the problem is, is that, uh, we, you know, and things were simple in the fact that we had tasks, there were things that needed to be done. And I think the, the connectivity of society was such that everyone had enough of a workload and, and to do their part that it all sort of seemed to work. Um, but na- right. now with the collapsing of technology in on itself over and over, we, have got this crazy amount of self-awareness now because there's cameras everywhere. There's like, everyone's constantly like writing their story and posting pictures of themselves. Like think about it. Think about a hundred years ago or or 50 years ago, Mm -hmm. how many pictures of someone's that they saw of themselves in a lifetime. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like maybe 30, 40, 50, a hundred. Now people are taking like, (laughs) I, I was at the I was at the Blue Lagoon in Iceland a, a couple months ago, and I was hanging out in this giant, crazy, beautiful, uh, natural hot spring. And I saw this this person walk walk into the, the the spring, and she had a selfie stick and a camera. Anyway, this is like a hundred degree, un, unbelievably beautiful natural uh, you know a thing. She walks in there and starts taking pictures of herself like rapid fire and is like posing in fluid gestures from in from all different angles and continues to walk around the whole thing for like five, ten minutes just looking into the lens of the camera, taking hundreds and hundreds of photos like that. That person took more pictures of herself in ten minutes uh, than most people prior to, I don't know, 30 years ago took of themselves or saw of themselves in their entire life. And also she missed seeing the, the natural wonder that everyone else was enjoying. Well, so, yeah, you know, um, 90% of all the photos ever taken in the history of mankind were taken in the last two years. <laughs> I believe I thought you were going to say the last 10 minutes, but yeah, <laughs> but I totally believe that man. And, and so what it's doing is it's like, it's making people hyper aware of their own existence. And mm. if you don't, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't have the compassion to deal with that, it gets, it gets bad, man. It gets the suffering increases immensely because people realize that we're like, you know, we're hairless monkeys floating in the middle of infinity, but now what? 
now what? Well, and so yeah, and not to not to cut you off, but just to finish my idea there is it's like so what do people do in the face of oblivion? Well, they have to cork it with something, and for a long time, religion and philosophy was a way to cork that, but now it's technology. Now it's technology, and I think also, I mean, with this sort of this self-referential you know, existence that everybody finds themselves in. It's, it's put a lot of people in the position of making themselves into brands. You know, Mm -hmm. everybody's a brand all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I mean, I, I have a, you know, a very mixed relationship with that because, you know, part of like what I do is sure you got to craft your brand, like, and you do it. I commented on your, on your Instagram post a couple of weeks ago, like I thought your, uh, you know, the little icon of, of your face was very mm. iconic. I mean, that's a very, that's great branding for what it is your, your, your offering is, you know, Thank you. but you know, making that into a global phenomenon is very, <laughs> it's very weird because <laughs> you know, not everybody can be a brand. It's sort of like the, 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 the Buddhist Cohen, like the world also needs ditch diggers, you know, and Absolutely. that, that, that's part of it. So, so, okay. So, I mean, we've talked about, about the schism, but what, what do we do? What's like a practical, what, what's practical instruction for people to, to kind of reclaim their authenticity and reclaim their, their groundedness and their, their own humanity? I, I think the first step is just realizing that it's a problem. Right. A you know, people, <laughs> people have to realize that they're – in order to embrace and accept their – well, one, to take responsibility for their, their lives, to embrace – uh, their individuality in a, in a healthy way, as opposed to, uh, an egoic way. Um, yeah, you have to realize that you're distracting, you know, all of this, the, the thing that's so, um, tempting and so tricky about what we're experiencing now is the fact that like from every angle, you can rationalize the behavior, and, and that's what's really tough about it is because people can can post a, a million pictures of themselves on, on the Internet and say, oh, no, no, no. It's just uh, it's just cool. I like sharing my life with people <laughs> and everyone buys it. You know, it's like, no, you're you're like de- like some people, <laughs> some people if I see their their Instagram and I look at their pictures of themselves, I'm like, I get this weird feeling that the way that they're looking into the lens of the camera, it's like the same look on their face is like a child looking at their parent, like dying for their attention. Like, please look at me, father, or please look at me, mother, <laughs> like recognize me. And it's like the same look through, you know, social media and those pictures. And it's very, a very jarring feeling. Um, but anyway, yeah, man, I think recognizing that it's an issue. And then I mean, one of the things that I did anyway, that's really helped me pop out of some of that, just, um, you know, rat hitting a, a a feeder bar to get a food pellet type of behavior with Mm -hmm. social media and the internet. It's just putting it away, like drawing some boundaries to yourself and being like, all right, I'm going to look at my social media like twice a day Mm -hmm. or when you get home at night, like take your phone and go put it in the other room, just leave it there. And like, yeah. It's sort of like with whenever you begin trying to meditate for the first time, you know, everyone gets the fidgets because they're not used to just sitting there without uh, uh, an insane amount of input. Yeah, sit and do nothing for 20 minutes. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I tell people who come to me. That's where we start. Just sit and do nothing for 20 minutes. Forget trying to be the Buddha. Forget trying to, you know, repeat a mantra 108 times. Let's just put the device away and sit still for 20 minutes. And Absolutely. So many people can't do it. Absolutely. And yeah. And so once you, you know, get, get over the fidgets, you just have to kind of continue trying that for a few times and you get used to not messing with anything. But in the, in the same way that your hands get used to not always fidgeting with a phone or, a, you know, the Netflix remote or whatever it might be. And you can just sit there and be a person in the world without fooling with something, you know, the, the body and the mind is connected. You know, it's like, when your your hands and your body gets used to resting and just simply being, your mind also doesn't need things to fidget with as much either. And in a clarity 
begins to emerge because you can actually think for once because the the flow of your mind is not being hijacked by the noise of the external world. Right, 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 right. So, yeah, I mean, and a lot of great suggestions that you put forth there. Um, I mean, one that's really helped me with my sleeping, especially is I, I keep my, um, I, mean, I, I don't always do it, but I, I really try. And when I do, it's successful. Um, my, uh, apartment where I live. It's, it's two stories. And I keep my phone, my smartphone downstairs when I sleep. Um, because I was just finding, you know, if I, if I wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason, I was like rolling over and Mm -hmm. scanning through Instagram or just watching something on YouTube Mm -hmm. and just how it was kind of disrupting my circadian rhythm and just kind of always creating the sequence of flashing imagery before my eyes is you know it's it's kind of like that scene in clockwork orange you know when (laughs) when he's sitting there with his eyes just being you know Uh open and i found that to be very 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 helpful um but you know i know uh the practice of meditation and um and you're really dialed in with that and you even have aids to help people with that the you know your binaural beats and and sound frequencies to help people kind of dr- drop into that space mm-hmm. um, as generic as a question as it is and and i've noticed i was looking at your uh, at uh <laughs> The astral hustle, and you know, we we share a lot of the same guests, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. which I've noticed. And but um, you know, I, I wanted to ask, but in this age that we've done a great job of sort of setting up the you know the imagery and sort of the the problems of this age, why do you think meditation is so important today? Because I feel it's more important today than it's ever been. But, I agree. Yeah, but I mean, wh- why do you think so? I think that it's because um, we're at a time where our our neurons are being blasted so hard <laughs> with so much data and so much of the amount of advertisement and marketing and um, you know social influence and all the stuff that's hitting our brains so much um, is creating a separation from our experience like never before, our experience of life. And I think that, you know, as far as the idea of happiness goes, whatever that means, you know, I I think that happiness is really like human stability with the, a maximum level of, um, being able to thrive in your own, the expression of your creativity and have a minimum amount of, um, chaos. Hmm. And, what happens, I think, is that we are all so inundated with chaos because of the way that society has had done this weird M. Night Shyamalan twist in the last five years even. And so there's so much confusion and uh, delusion happening. It's, it's really, really crazy. Like the question of reality has become – uh, something that people actually argue about, you know, if you look at politics and stuff like, no, people are, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like facts are now things that are, people think are opinions. Yeah. It's really insane, man. Which is and also so, kind of appropriate because it, right. <laughs> I mean, what, what is all this anyway? But I get right. what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so like, man, we get out, we like, we don't ever get to actually experience, um, the beauty of like, I think, what we're meant to, I don't know if meant is the right thing, but like the thing that gives humans great pleasure is, is, uh, actually being to getting in the driver's seat of their own life and getting to have tactile experiences and actually being able to think and understand what it is that they want to experience in life and what it is, how can they find that stable place where they get to find this, creative sense of expression that like enriches their life and allows them to feel like they've made some connection or contribution to the world or, or themselves or each other. And you can never get that if you're just like managing your Instagram likes and, you know, trying to not be furious over reading political news articles. And I think that meditation really wakes you up to an awareness of what's going on and awareness of your own experience 
and with that, you can learn how to begin to remove the things in your life that are toxic and the things that are causing you suffering and distraction and pain and also the things that are just straight up useless and then um, you know, move into things that, that make you happy, that make you feel fulfilled and, uh, and all that. And to kind of increase your possibility of connection, right? I mean, I, I think so much, I mean, I can speak for myself, so much happiness comes from within authentic moments of, of connection, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, and as much as I do love the experience of the dimension that is the internet and cyberspace, you know, there's, it is no replacement for, you know, tactile connection in 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 whatever in three-dimensional land you know yeah yeah absolutely man whatever absolutely yeah and the, the nature the nature of reality was it's so trippy man because you can take a very like you know existential slash psychedelic view on the whole nature of reality and it's like well you know and and throw in a little bit of like Hindu mysticism, Maya stuff. And it's like, well, you know, what's real anyway? It's all, it's all sort of part of this, this grand illusion, divine play. And here we are in these meat suits spinning on this rock <laughs> floating through space. So what the fuck does any of it matter at all? Just try your best to be happy. Try your best to be connected. And if Kellyanne Conway is talking about, alternative facts you know fuck it they're right it's all alternative <laughs> facts you know you can take that view but it is really interesting how to, to not take that view how elastic everybody's becoming with like the, the the truth it just feels like it's all just one big con that everybody is aware of and nobody seems to really care about I agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree, man. And yeah. oh, hey, look, we agreed. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, like the market and time, two people on the internet agreed. Um, but yeah, man, like I, I think that the philosophical viewpoint that you put forward, which I uh, I agree with, I think it's fun, but it's just philosophy, and I honestly think it's a way of bypassing reality because you can look at yeah. it, it's almost like having a deterministic philosophical outlook and then just sort of giving up and being like, well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen and I, I can't do anything about it. I know? agree with that. I do. I just kind of like to play the game as an intellectual, you know, because it's, it's kind of fun, but I do agree. I do. Oh, me. No, I, I love playing the game too, but I think yeah. it's also like, it, I, I noticed, I actually noticed over the last year so much of that, that I, I intentionally stepped away from talking about, you know, kind of spinning philosophical yarns because I realized like, Hmm, I think this might not be what people need. I think that's like, it's turning into this kind of fun way of delusion where if you just can get off on tangents of talking about, you know, the fact that we're all on uh, in uh, some, the teardrop of some sad alien working in an office somewhere. And that's what, you know, what life is then, then, uh, well, that's cool. But like, you know, knock on the knock on the table in front of you and realize like okay no this is this is actually life and regardless of whatever the philosophical implications of of potential of what it might be um what are you doing with what is absolutely i i i do subscribe to that and and really you, you know, you you can get out in the whole multiverse tangents all you want and make it, you know, really funny and entertaining. But the reality of it is like, you know, my sadness is real. Exactly. <laughs> my pain is real. Yeah. You know, the, you know, food that's in my refrigerator is real. I mean, these are, or that I don't have in my refrigerator. It's, it's real. And, you know, these are real things that we have to come to terms with and, and not be dismissive of, especially I think the, the, the pain stuff, you know, mm -hmm. because th those things can really alter the course of your life, you know, and if you're just constantly dismissive of them and spiritually bypassing them, um, you won't do anything about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's one of the biggest things that I observe with people. And it's, it's, it's uh, a tough part of, being a human, but man, you see, or I see people just like 
getting so caught up into the next obsession and the next obsession and the next obsession mm. or going deep into one thing so so far because they just don't want to take responsibility for their own lives or or accept their pain, acknowledge their pain and begin to work with it and work through it. And it's just this um, it's kind of a, just this dark, long, protracted, low level suffering that people get locked into. And I think that through talking about it, it builds um, it builds a bit of confidence, you know, and I think that I mean, at least my my outlook on it and my approach to dealing with that level of just it's just a part of the human condition, truly. But mm. my my reasoning to uh, as far as a way to deal with it is that, you know, the way that we approach the people in our lives sets a tone and, and builds confidence or, or a lack of trust in those relationships. And I think that if you are the one that brings a level of openness and sincerity and a lack of judgment, a clear lack of judgment towards your relationships, then in time that will build trust with people. It may be that moment or it may be a year from then that will allow them to open up and not only uh, be them true, their, their actual selves with you, but share the things that they're working with as a person. And that shit right there mm. is the real meat of human experience. Yes, it is. Absolutely. I, I completely, I, I completely agree with the, you know, I mean, I guess you can distill it to vulnerability, right? Mm. I mean, what is it that essentially makes up the human condition, right? I mean, the, the, you know, we first of all, we have, and you've talked a lot about this on, on this podcast thus far, but we have this gift of awareness. You know, we have this ability to look around this whole reality and distill what's working and what isn't working and where the problems lies, where the problems lie and where the successes lie and where the triumphs lie and, and kind of pinpoint this experience for our stuff that is, you know, as far as we know, anyway, other mammals cannot do. Mm -hmm. and, and that is an amazing thing. And add to that, you know, this uh, ability to reflect the, the, the awe, you know, and, and this, this, this sense of vulnerability that, and every great uh, philosopher, or, you know, or, or artist throughout the course of human history has expressed that in some way shape or form or another again you know i'm just i'm on this american revolution kick you know it's mm -hmm. and like you know the declaration of independence is like this this statement about the nature of man you know not just the country and king george the third and their displeasure with him but you know life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and that's just such like a, a huge way of of relating in the world right Mm -hmm. um, but you know, but back to the, back to the present time, and and yeah, I'm really curious, and and maybe you share a little bit of of the process of of writing your book. But I mean, are you what, are you doing like a, a lot of research, or is this kind of like like how are how are you? What's your take on man's current relationship with? kind of vulnerability and how you see, especially millennials, I think. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. How old are you? I'm 35. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we're, we're not too far apart a little bit, but, um, you know, how younger people are really relating with this idea of, of vulnerability and I don't know, or is the static getting in the way of that? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it, it seems to be, uh, yeah, it seems to be like the, from I, I can't speak for people that are of that generation, but what I can say is that what I've observed is that um, people they seem to have a hard time um, not not dealing with the static, but knowing that there ever was a thing other than the static. Ah, uh, yes, right. You know and. It's like I – the internet really started like popping whenever I was probably, I don't know, 15, 16. I mean, it was around before that, but right. it, it started happening a lot then. You know, my own experience, I had all of this time to 
know what it was like to live life without a, you know, a computer around really, or a, a cell phone or something like that. And I started doing a lot of, you know, the, the, a lot of the experiences and things that I had, um, were in a world prior to the technological interface that we experience today. And I, I sort of just feel, feel a bit of empathy for people who are, were born, uh, you know, after that, where all they've ever known is that, and everything is, you know, everything has its advantage and its disadvantage, of course, like, just like you were talking earlier, man, like the, as far as the human condition goes and our self-awareness, it, it, all great joys and all great pains all have a receipt and the receipt is the, the balance and the polarity to, to that thing. And I think that uh, our, our, <laughs> the deep existential pain that we can feel as humans having the awareness of our own awareness and our mortality is balanced by our ability to be able to experience the awe that you were talking about. Hmm. Yes. And with, with people who only, who, who are coming of age now in the internet age, um, I wonder, you know, I wonder how that's going to play out. I wonder how I, yeah, I think about that a lot. I wonder how it's going to play out. And I also wonder how that, um, that mindset, I guess, or somebody whose you know, fundamental blueprint has been programmed under that umbrella, how they are going to fix the world's problems. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. no, ma no matter what side of the fence you are, it doesn't matter if you're a pot smoking hippie liberal or a far right neocon. Everybody agrees that, you know, there are some serious problems going on on within the planet today, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. how we're going to fix them. People disagree on, but you know, I think, I mean, I, I think you probably agree that the first step in addressing these big problems is a shift in our consciousness, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. Is, I mean, and then what? Yeah, I, I mean, that it's always blew my mind that in school subjectivity is not taught. I, I think if if they if they made subjectivity one of the fundamentals, like math and, and science, uh, in social studies, then it, the world would be such a drastically different place. Because I mean. Perhaps it's just me, but I think that like the the most important thing I probably ever figured out was the fact that my reality is a perception. Hmm. Right. That your reality is perception. Yeah. But uh, well, I mean, keep going on that because I mean, yeah, you 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 think your reality is perception, and you've said that, but you've also said that you've seen some sort of like schisms within this thing that we call reality that people like are, are bypassing. So don't you think we kind of need to agree a little bit on what reality is? Well, no, no, no. We can agree that we all have individual interpretations of what's out there and that no one's correct and no one's incorrect. And although that does lead to what you're talking about or has the potential to lead towards schisms of like, okay, so Every, yeah, I guess identity politics essentially is what that could lead to. But I think that if people um, actually had some some schooling you know, and, and or taught you know, some fundamentals around the idea of like, hey, you know, you, what you are experiencing is not fact. It, it's an interpretation I, I would hope would lead to um, some some empathy and some patience and some an actual an actual reduction of the ego because people would realize like, OK, um, we're all making guesses, so let's not blow up any buildings tomorrow based on our <laughs> ideologies. <laughs> well, we're all making guesses, and you know, and this is a very common theme that I repeat on, on on this podcast. Not only are we all making guesses, but the distance um, of which each person is making their own guess is much smaller than it ever has been before. A hundred years ago, yeah. somebody blowing up. Well, they didn't blow it up, but lighting a, a fire to a building in Kabul. And if you lived in Austin, Texas, it might as well have been Mars. Right. It just, it didn't matter. And you two or me too 
a hundred years ago, we would have thought the same thing. We would have been men of our times and we would have looked at it and been, well, that's, that's takes months to get there. If you can even get there, afford to get there. Um, you know, you cross the ocean on ships and stagecoach and horses. I mean, you know, you just didn't do it. You know, the idea of the world being so much smaller now Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the need to agree more than not agree is now more prevalent than ever. Right. I mean, yeah. And I don't think maybe we don't, I don't think we necessarily need to agree. I just think that we, we all need to just realize the fact that we're all wrong. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just level. It's all gray area. <laughs> we're all wrong, man. And, and, and so, I mean, my mind brings the logical conclusion of we're all wrongness to like, well, hey, let's all let's all create a little bit of space and like not jump to insane, um, like accusatorial and infinitely uh, proselytizing type of ideologies or ways that we're trying to force everyone to live their lives, dude. But that, like, you know, we're all wrong thing. It's just it, I, I hear you say that, and I'm just like, oh my god, the whole problem with the with the world is everybody thinks they're right. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Everybody insists that their way is right. 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 And that's why I think subjectivity would be such an important thing to teach because you say, hey, no, no it's not that everyone's right. It's just that everyone is. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. But that the, this, I, I mean, is that just misplaced ego? Everybody just insisting that they're right, that their God is the better God, that their political party is the better political party, their race is the better race. Is that misplaced ego, fear? I mean, what is that exactly? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 a sort of an accident of our, our design, I think. It's because our, our brains are in our heads and we have a sense of self-awareness. We have a consciousness that we feel like is coming out of our heads. So we feel like we are a sun, our mind is the sun casting light through a dark universe. So we are, each of us do feel like we're the center of the world because we are, you know, our mind is emanating out of our brains. And so to us, it is the center of everything. But the problem is that like what we, we don't know what we, what we don't know. So therefore the limit of our knowledge is what we already know. So we, we aren't, we are unaware of the unknown. Therefore we feel like we know everything. And because the human, you know, our biology, in order to believe that we have the value to procreate as an organism, we, we have to remain in a stable psychological ecosystem of the self, which enables us to believe that our value is greater than the value of the person next to us. Because in order for us to go on and to have the will to be, hmm. to continue eating and, and having drive as, a, as an organism, we, we have to believe that we're better than other people so that we think there's value so that that makes everyone <laughs> believe that they're right because it's just this weird that's like elevator accordion effect of our biology I, I was writing this thing in my, my book just recently called this judgment in our dna and it's that's why i think my theory of of why like why will you be sitting in traffic you know and, and there's a, some people walking through the crosswalk and you see someone, a stranger, someone's son, you know, and you're like, fuck that guy. Look at that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, why do we all do that? Why is it in the back of our heads? And I think it's because of what I'm talking about. It's like we, the, our, our psychology is, is unique. And as I said, and it's it's need for this stability that's so delicate. And I think that we it's just this bizarre part of our evolution. where We have to believe we're better than the next person so that we have uh, a valuable uh, so we have enough value to procreate. And I, I continue with the idea that like if you think that that's not true and, or if you think that I'm rude for suggesting it, you're doing it to me right now. And if you were on uh, if you were <laughs> if, if, if you were on a on a on a ship and, uh, you know, it, it began to sink and you and 10 strangers jumped on a boat and made it to an island and then you were lucky and a crate of food supplies showed up and you were all sharing the food supplies. But as they begin to dwindle after a couple of days, how fast do you think your mind would start pointing out the negative aspects of all the other people around you? Real fast. Real fast. You start to rationalize why not only some people weren't worth having food, but why perhaps some people needed to be killed so that they wouldn't take any of the potential food that you might might have there in the near future. 
uh, right, and you start looking for someone to blame. Exactly. Yeah, I mean exactly. that that that's another part of the the, the whole thing. I mean, yes kind of even from a, 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 Dar, a Darwinian standpoint, I mean, intelligent design, there is a little implication in there that it's, you know, survival of the fittest sort of thing. But moving past that and getting to like intellectual superior, intellectual superiority, I mean, we got to have someone to blame. Mm-hmm. If things aren't right. going well, right? It's, it's not my fault. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's, it's, yep. And and that's the, the weird the malleability of our ability to conceptualize is, is as I said, every great thing has a receipt. You know, our ability to conceptualize is so valuable because, it, you know, the, the growth of our frontal brain, you know, we had the amygdala, which was our basic like animal fight or flight reptilian lower brain. And as we evolved over time, you know, and our, our frontal lobes begin growing we began to be able to conceptualize and and all this stuff and that was very helpful it actually helped us as far as i understand uh you know kill all of the neanderthals <laughs> because we were able to communicate and group them into small areas where there wasn't any food <laughs> and um but it helps us because if we're walking through the forest and a tree is falling and our you know the pace of our our walking is going to line up with the falling of the tree it tells us to stop because we conceptualize the fact that we would die um, that's helpful in survival, but whenever you get into things like politics, it's it just makes it where you can create any story that you want, and then pack it in there with a whole bunch of fear and and conviction, and just essentially put your fingers in your ears and and uh, talk, and and there's nothing that can really be done about it because no day nowadays, as far as in America, well, f- for now. No one's cutting your head off for having a, a, a polarizing political opinion. So people say whatever they want. Well, and that's that's kind of a good thing. Have you ever read um, The Better Angels of Our Nature? No. Uh, you'd like that, and, and you should check it out. For um, It's kind of an exhaustive read. I mean, it's not a simple read, but it's um, written by this guy named Steven Pinker. I mean, it'd be kind of great for your book, but it's, he just exhaustively unpacks from a historical perspective how we really are living in the most peaceful time ever. Mm-hmm. You, We look around, and it's very easy for us to say, oh my God, we're running around with our, you know, our heads cut off, and you see all this insanity and Donald Trumpism, and, you know, and it's, it looks insane, and we're destroying the planet. But you know, however many hundreds hundreds of years ago or whatever, someone like you or me, healthy, white, you know, 30 to 45-year-old males, the leading cause of death at that time was death by violence. Mm -hmm. You know, we were defending our homes from being raped and pillaged. We had to go off to war. Our heads would have gotten chopped off. Definitely. (laughs) That That was life. Yeah. You know? Yep. These days, you know, you, you, you know, I mean, I've, I have never in, in my 44 years on the planet, I've never been on the receiving end of a random act of violence, you know? Mm. And that is basically a very new phenomenon within the course of human events, you know? Absolutely. So, do, do you think that that's going to continue to scale? I don't know. I I think so. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder like complexity tends to make humans feel freak out because we can only, this is one of the things I wonder as far as like human civil civilization going forward. And although there is a ton of land out there, Mm. uh, we, we all want to be in the tribe. We want to be in the beehive and around major cities because it's easier to get resources and all that stuff. But like you look at, you know, there's only a certain amount of things that our, our little monkey brains can think of at once before we freak out because then it becomes too much and we feel vulnerable again and we feel like something is a threat. Like look at traffic. Everything's all good when you're on the freeway in L.A. and there's no other cars. Mm. But the second that you hit rush hour traffic, everyone freaks out because it's too complex. You know, and, and you start doing that, the, the, either the, you see, you know, getting angry at the, the, like if you, it's, it truly is like if you, if you give a, a, a monkey, a, 
uh, uh, camera with a flash on it. It's sitting there fiddling with it, and then the flash goes off in his face, and he gets mad and it smashes the camera because it doesn't understand what's going on. <laughs> it's essentially the same circuitry working in our brains whenever we're in traffic and someone cuts us off. You know, monkey wants to smash because we don't understand why they would do that and why they're doing it to us. However, truly, they're not doing it to us. It's just happening. Just as the camera isn't intentionally flashing that monkey in the eyes, it's just it just happened. Um, so complexity frustrates us. So I wonder whenever you know the the density of our population grows to a point where um, it's hard not to have that that feeling. Will the the bell curve of peace? go the other way yeah yeah i i i i think we're safe i think i feel that trajectory is safe unless there is some apocalyptic um you know some kind of apocalyptic event that does occur which is Mm -hmm. possible um i mean you see what's (laughs) happening in cape town with the water no Cape Town, South Africa is going to become the first major city. Um, and they have like, they're, they're calling it day zero. Um, I think it's like April 15th or April 16th or something. There's going to be no water. Oh my God. Like no water. They're going to have no water. And I mean, it, it, they're going to starting on April 16th, unless a huge amount of rain comes between now and then it's literally going to be, um, you're, you're going to have these um, regulators on, on your faucet. You'll be able to shower for three to four minutes a day, uh, flush the toilet twice, and that's it. Wow. So, um, yeah, I mean, like some kind of apocalyptic thing like that. I mean, that's pretty heavy. Cape Town a, is a major city. So something like that can maybe skew this, this discussion, you know. Mm-hmm. People will start mm-hmm. killing each other for water. Yes, they will. <laughs> my my little uh, thought experiment about being on the island will become an abrupt reality, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so I, knowing your – well, having a general idea of your viewpoint of the current uh, you know, political situation in America, how do you, you – know, outside of just your frustration with ideologies that are thriving that are opposing to your own, mm-hmm. how do you actually think that, that this will play out? The, the current administration? Yeah. Um, well, there's kind of a, a couple different parallel paths. One, very tactically and immediately. I mean, I, it, it, it do think it's very, very possible that he will not make it through his four years. Um, you know, I mean, not to get into a whole pundit sort of thing, but if you kind of look at the Mueller investigation and the people... Uh, you know, the team that Mueller has, these people are, uh, you know, A-list all-star federal prosecutors and trial lawyers. They do not take work if there is nothing there. Mm -hmm. You know, these 20 people on the team are the top of their game. You know, and they're not all federal employees. A couple of them are. Some of them are just, you know, top, uh, you know, New York trial attorneys. You know, they don't take work if there's nothing there. This isn't sport for them. You know what I mean? So right. that, I mean, that this is very micro. So there's that. But on sort of the bigger level, I do, um, I'm, I'm going to take the optimistic route. I'm, I'm feeling that this has caused um, there to be a much bigger discussion of an awakening, of an awareness, of like, oh shit, this is really bad. We didn't mean to do this. What are we going to, you know, we have to fix it. I think more and more people are getting, starting to get involved in a, in a conversation of, of compassion and of sensibility and of, of, you know, rising to their highest potential to, to get out of this mess. Because, you know, we have to understand in the last election, 90 million people who could have voted didn't vote. Nine million. That's such a huge number, you know, and the census data basically tells us that the majority of those people are live in urban areas. Um, a huge number of them are, um, are, uh, young people. So, you know, g- getting people involved in, in 
you know, inspire to participate in the political sphere that can change their own reality is, um, I think, I think it could, it could happen, but it always comes down to, well, okay, who is the alternate choice? Mm -hmm. So who that person is going to be, that's going to inspire them. You know, it's who's the next Bernie Sanders. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's like this current situation is, um, (laughs) it's not pulling the bandaid off. It is remove the body cast from the burn victim. (laughs) 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 And I feel like, yeah, it seems like people are, are just getting exhausted by by the frivolity of everything. It's it's just, I agree. It's becoming like the, the fourth wall is, is gone, man. It seems like, and uh, I really hope that it, all of this, the, the blame and, and aggravation and anger of people having different opinions about each other. I really hope that it like, just as you said, it energizes people who, who want a peaceful and like rational society. But I really hope that it makes people, I hope that the thing that comes is beneficial from everything that has been going on is that people recognize the pain and all of the nasty shit that has, has happened because of it. And it makes them actually uh, have some empathy, you know, in them for the, for, for, for other people. I hope so. I'm with you. <laughs> well, <laughs> this has been a great podcast. Thank you so much for doing it, Corey. And um, tell me the name of your book again. Oh, my, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And the name is Now is the Way. And uh, probably end of this year, early next year is when it will be out in physical form. Okay. Well, uh, we'll look for that. And yeah, we'll catch up between now and then for sure. But thank you so much for, for doing it. My pleasure. Thank you, Zach.